We're joined today by Robin Pecknold of Fleet Foxes. The new album, Shore, is out now on Anti. And uh, Robin, I really appreciate you taking the time today. My sense on this record is that it really kind of got started three years ago when you were surfing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I got the title. I mean, you know, uh, the title came to me in a fairly scary way where I, you know, snapped my leash surfing and ended up kind of not really sure. I I was a little bit convinced I was going to drown and started hyperventilating. And it took me like 15 minutes to swim, you know, into shore from this rip current. Uh, it was kind of the closest I've ever been to like a near death experience. And so, um, I don't know, I felt so relieved um, when I made it back to shore that that feeling really stuck with me as something to kind of like keep in mind for the music, you know, because it was such a different feeling than like happiness almost. It was just like a gratitude to be alive and to like, you know, appreciate what you kind of take for granted all the time. So I think that, you know, that became like the the event that sort of, you know, set the set the course for the record for sure. And you know, sure sort of equals safety and who doesn't need that right now? Exactly, yeah, exactly. You know, you dropped the album, you, you did not just drop the album on the Autumnal Equinox, you dropped that album at the exact moment of the Autumnal Equinox, 8.31 a.m. Kansas City time, Tuesday, September 22nd, and there, there's something, um, of course, Fleet Foxes has always made me feel like it's music that connects me to the natural world, but you've sort of really upped the ante with, with this one. Yeah, I mean, that was just kind of a, you know, that's something I've always wanted to do, you know, just kind of release an album with very little lead up and, and kind of close to its release. Um, and it just, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the, like you said, you know, I like tying the album, tying album, I like when albums feel like they're, you know, really tied to something outside of our, you know, a little outside of our realm of concern or, you know, a little more timeless or more natural. And, um, it just kind of worked out, you know, the first lyric on the album is in summer all over. And the last lyric is now the quarter moon is out. Those are both coincidences. And that's the phase the moon was entering um, on the 23rd. And, you know, it was just certain faded, you know, it was very, recording in July and August was a very, you know, intense and wonderful experience. And there were just all these kind of great coincidences and it felt very charmed kind of. And so, you know, I just became adamant that that be the day it comes out. And I'm really glad that it, worked out that way, you know, because now is as good a time as ever to try, try something different, you know, and, and also I grew up buying albums after school on Tuesdays and listening to them all night and then talking about them with my friends the next day. And so I think Tuesdays kind of like, I think that's the day for album releases. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of time, you are planning an expanded version of this record. The 15 tracks that make up Shore, have really been on your back. Uh, it's it's something that you have pretty much done. Uh, the yeah. you're planning on nine additional tracks with the members of your band, and you add the nine and the fifteen, and you get twenty four songs, one for each hour of the day. Where did where did that idea come from? I guess from that meme of the woman looking around with all the, like the math equations around her, you know that <laughs> uh, <laughs> that kind of energy. Um, oh, well, I thought the original idea for the record was 24 songs, one representing every hour of the day and no first or last song, but just you just start kind of at whatever hour, um, you know, you you wanted. And then, you know, if you wanted just kind of, you know, have this really experimental section and at like, you know, like almost like a, a dream sequence kind of thing between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. or something like REM sleep and then, you know, calming music in the morning and, and brighter music during the day. And um, so I think we can, you know, that was kind of like, the background idea for something like the scaffolding for some of the stuff on shore. And it, I think it's going to be cool to expand it into that idea. Um, and, and yeah, to work with, you know, to write, actually write songs with those guys for the first time actually ever, because it's, you know, always been kind of a different lineup every album and it's always been um, mostly my vision, you know? And um, so, you know, in this period where we don't have any touring to look forward to, um, I think a lot of musicians are just trying to come up with creative ways to stay busy and, um, and this, you know, in lieu of retraining as a, you know, a 
user experience uh, computer engineer, this is kind of my solution to this time period and what it means for the entertainment business. <laughs> Robin Pecknold of Fleet Fox is our guest. The new album is Shore. I, the, the start of this project, in a way, was, what, a couple of years ago? And the music came first. You spent a year and a half on that music. Uh, and then all of a sudden, COVID hit. Uh, and you didn't have lyrics. And the whole idea of this album was to do something that was, you know, bright and comforting uh, and you were really writing to put yourself in that place. It was almost aspirational for yourself. Yeah, for sure. I also think, you know, one of the, um, I think I spent a long time kind of under the impression that serious music was, was the same as dark music, where like, um, you know, I, I think I just kind of equated those two things in a way that was a little bit short-sighted or a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit incomplete, you know, because I think, I, and so I think the challenge with this one was to make something that still felt like serious music in terms of like how it's made and how it's constructed and, you know, what, but, but that wasn't dark, you know, and just, and, but that didn't feel cheap or corny or, you know, whatever those, you know, the, the, the minefield that you step into when you decide to not kind of hide behind a certain, you know, emotional tenor, um, just, just kind of that became, those became the, the the fun problems to solve and the fun risks. And then definitely, you know, for, to be working on that kind of music, it's hard to stay melancholy, you know, I found. Like, every, you know, if we pulled up Can I Believe You to work on that song, we were smiling the whole time, you know, because it was just a fun song to work on. And, and that wasn't, you know, that was, if I was having a bad day that day, the music was, was solving that problem you know, in a totally different way and, and that I'm used to, you know, and I think that that remains, you know, um, an interesting, you know, I think as, as, you know, getting older a little bit, I'm 34 now and, and kind of, um, you know, thinking about, you know, what a person like me, you know, what, what, what I can give to the world that feels like valuable. I think it's stuff like this, you know, and I think that, this is the kind of thing that I can devote a lot of time and energy to and feel like when it, you know, I'm sharing it in a, in a kind of in good faith. You know, we, you know, we were talking about the music being essentially done. You were working in LA, COVID hit, you moved back to your apartment in New York city. And I really have a hard time imagining this, but you basically live across from a hospital where there were sirens, there were yeah. refrigeration trucks, uh, refrigerated trucks in the street that were serving as main, uh, you know, makeshift morgues. And this is not exactly the, the way that you set out to write, you know, warm and comforting, bright lyrics. No. So you you did you did video games. You tried baking for a while. Uh, you got involved in Black Lives Matter protests, but eventually you just had to get out of town uh, and yeah. started doing some road trips. Now, did you do those road trips thinking, "I'm going to come up with lyrics while I'm on the road"? Was that intentional? No, not at all. I was, you know, I think in that month of June, I was like, I just need to get out of the city. You know, there's finally some like some some leaves on the trees and you know there's we're kind of you know mid-spring is it, you know it's kind of takes takes a while in new york sometimes for 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 winter to end and you know spring can be kind of short and it was just i was just kind of chewing on the fact that i had this albatross of a half-finished album on my back and i didn't i i assumed it would take the rest of the year to finish and it would come out next year sometime um and but once I was on these drives, just like you know, six to twelve hour drives every day, just feeling like you know, kind of like ragged but kind of free. You know, I was kind of like, you know, didn't bring a change of clothes. I wasn't like showering. I felt kind of like, you know, like I did when I was you know, nineteen or twenty, and and you know, something about that mindset crept in, and all the lyrics just kind of came out of nowhere, and then, and it was like this huge gift, and because that was the main bottleneck in finishing the record, really. And um, it really just, you know, it was, it was that kind of thing of just like letting your current circumstances guide the lyrics a little bit instead of kind of like trying to reach for some other, you know, storyline or reach for some other thing, you know, because there was so much that I was thinking about that felt like, you know, transformative in some 
like psychological way as a result of you know being in lockdown for three months and um it just kind of materialized and and then i was off to the races so i could finish the record no problem you know once that was once that was in place and then um you know i couldn't feel i'm grateful every day for that weird charmed month you know because it really made all of this possible and and um and yeah you know ultimately i felt like maybe covid was so big that it made the record smaller and easier to approach oh 100 percent. yeah i mean it's really hard to you know see music as anything but a refuge and a you know you know you can't put a bunch of anxiety onto music at a time like this you know it has to be the safe haven you know um it's just that's just too much too much to hold our guest today robin pecknold of fleet foxes the new album shore is out now i absolutely love the story of the first song on the album you uh and, and you know i think that you you actually sort of thought well you know give it a try but your voice maybe wasn't working for you and i so the first voice we hear on the album isn't yours and yeah. I love the story of this vocalist, if you don't mind telling it. Yeah, she's an incredible singer named Uwade Akere. I met her, well, a friend of mine sent me a video, video of her covering Mykonos by Fleet Foxes about a year and a half ago. And I was just watched her other covers on her Instagram page, uh, which is uwade.music if you're interested. Um, and just our unreal texture to her voice and just an ease of singing and just like, you know, it's like she's just, right there where you want it where where you want to be mentally when she's singing it's just wonderful to, to hear um so you know and i had that piece of music and i was like oh this would be a great intro but you know i was trying to manipulate my voice so that because i wanted the first line that i sang to be for richard swift and that's the first line of the next song some um but i wanted this other piece of music to happen before it you know and then it was just you know kind of another cosmic alignment where a lot came into my attention and then she happened to be studying at Oxford when we were recording in France. So she was kind enough to take the train down and record with us for a day. Um, you know, and it was, it was just a beautiful day of recording. You know, I, I think like lyrically, and uh, you know, so, so much of the record ended up being about other people and stuff that we're going through collectively and less kind of some, you know, existential turning point that I might be in or, or something, you know, that wasn't really, um, that wasn't really my, my idea or that wasn't really happening. So um, having another voice at the top of the album kind of signaled like, okay, this is gonna be a slightly different experience in, in kind of mysterious ways when, you know, when you're just listening to it. And it's also not, it's gonna be other people forward, you know, other people first. You know, I was just thinking about that story from her perspective, you know, she obviously has reverence for what you do because she covered your song. And then all of a sudden she gets a phone call saying, would you like to get on a train to Paris to record the vocals to lead off the next album? She had to just be like stunned. What was her reaction? Well, she was, you know, we'd only ever talked on like text messaging before the session. And, you know, I obviously was, you know, she's 21, you know, we're strangers. I wanted, you know, Beatrice was the engineer and, and you know, she's great, you know, great, com cool, comforting person to, to, to spend time with. So, you know, I wanted her, uh, Uwade to be comfortable in the studio and not feel like it was, you know, either she was nervous because she liked the project or because, or, you know, weirded out because it was like, hey, you want to take the train to France and record on this thing and I'll, you know, rent you a hotel room. I don't know. It's all, you, you got to be careful in situations like that where you're like, hey, everything's cool but she was so i wasn't sure what to expect you know because we hadn't met but um she was she was probably the most um i was deeply inspired by just her whole demeanor that day i don't think i i think if i were in her position she was so calm and like confident and assured in this very like inspiring way you know it wasn't she wasn't like at all you know cocky or something but she was just like very stable in herself. And she's like, um, you know, I was very inspired because when I was 21, if I'd been in that position, I would have been a nervous wreck. And I would have been, you know, saying dumb things left and right. And, you know, but it was wonderful. We got to talk about our favorite bands and, you know, she was just, she would just go to the piano if there was a break in recording and start singing some Beatles song beautifully. And like, we recorded some of her covers and 
and uh, it was just kind of like I was very inspired by by that day recording her and, and seeing how she kind of carried herself as a person because it was it was it was very beautiful. You know, you mentioned the waiting in waist high water leads into sun blind and the fact that you wanted the first thing that came out of your lips on the album to be about Richard Swift. But you also name check all kinds of other artists, John Prine, Elliot Smith, David Berman, Jeff Buckley, Otis Redding, Jimmy Hendrix, Marvin Gaye. This whole album has a sort of an underlying thread of gratitude. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's, it was important to me to kind of, you know, I, I was just thinking about memory a lot and just how, you know, music is this kind of form of immortality for these people, you know, and, and they're, you know, we're learning their lessons every day when we're listening to their music and their, their points of view are, are being carried forward um, through their songs that we're still so, you know, listen to enjoy so much and listen to so much. And um, I felt like that was, you know, we're in this period where, you know, we, we, we need to be kind of memorializing people and carrying them forward and you know we're, we're losing people and and um that just felt like you know just felt very natural like you know it, it that was that felt like the most personal thing i could say was was to kind of make it for them because i'm such a music fan before i'm a musician you know i feel like that's it starts with fandom and, and then you, you know, you become enamored with it. And then if you have the, a talent for it, you cultivate it, you know, but I'm really a music fan first and it's meant so much to me. And, and um, you know, I think I've already been hearing from people, you know, like, oh, I, I'm listening to this because I never heard this guy and I'm listening to it now because of, because of that song or, you know, I love, you know, I love being able to be part of that chain of transmission because um, that's, you know, that's how we've always, you know, that's the same as, the Odyssey or the Illid, you know, telling these myths about people and carrying them forward. And, and, um, and that's, I don't know, that's feels super important right now. You know, we also love the fact that you have, you know, been embracing some of the living musicians that you admire. And one of the musicians that you worked with on that track in particular, Kevin Morby from Kansas city. Yes, I know. I was going to ask about <laughs> Kevin. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's in Kansas City right now. I've been talking to him a bit. I know he recorded his parts from Kansas City. Yes. And, uh, and he moved I here was, just, you know, he just in time for COVID. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> They've got a great setup, though. I, I, it seems like that's, there's anywhere. I've been jealous of, you know, I'm in this one bedroom apartment in New York. That's where I've been the whole time. And I sneak on the roof sometimes, but I've been jealous seeing Kevin's garage recording studio and his, all of his, like, I don't know. He's got a good setup going. I'm jealous. And and it was such a, you know, love his music so much. Like my sister manages Fleet Foxes and she also manages Kevin. And um, so we have a you know, great relationship and, you know, he's, he's making Kansas City proud for sure. Absolutely. You mentioned some of the artists that have inspired you and one of them you really took to heart in that you wrote Young Man's Game basically as an homage to John Prine's songwriting style. And it's really an entry point into the whimsical side of Fleet Foxes, which is a sentence I'm not sure that I ever thought I'd be saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a funny song to work on because I was like really thinking about it like, okay. I mean, lyrically, I'm actually really proud of that song. And it's 100% influenced by John Prine in terms of like having this, you know, classic way of kind of repeating a, a you know a lyric at the end of every verse or you know kind of reframing the meaning of a, of a of a you know kind of hackneyed phrase or that that kind of you know certain funny lines that are meant to make people smile and musically it's not really it's more of a kind of like Joni Mitchell Fleetwood Mac kind of like but but kind of goofy and I, I felt like um <laughs> it was me it was meaningful to me to put that song on the album because I don't think it's like a masterpiece of a song. And that's like, <laughs> and that is not like something I would have ever let myself do in the last like 10 years was just like, you know, let a song be kind of a curiosity or kind of a like novelty song, you know? And it's something about that with the lyric. I know that sounds like a weird, a weird thing to feel like in a, a personal achievement, but <laughs> um, but like, it's lower quality or something, but um, just like pairing that, the kind of like silly music of that song with the lyric that is resonant 
and kind of speaks to why that wasn't possible before, you know, that felt like a nice thing to put in the middle of the album as a kind of bridge between the two sides of the record while also being this kind of outlier. Robin Pecknell, The Fleet Fox is our guest. Shore is the name of the new album we've been talking about. Some of the artists that inspired you and one of the people that really inspired you to go into this line in the first place is Brian Wilson. Yeah. And so that inspiration is like, this is totally yours, you know, in every way, but Cradling Mother, Cradling Woman, not only takes like the production style and values but you also took Brian Wilson's voice and incorporated yeah, it. For sure. Yeah. I mean, he was so, it was so, they were so gracious to let us use that little clip of him counting the song in and some clips of a, you know, a studio dialogue from a Pet Sounds box set session that just, you know, a clip of him layering vocal after vocal, just a cappella. And that clip, um, you know, when I heard it as a teenager, that, was, that clip is what made me want to be a musician because it, it was kind of the user user's manual or the kind of, spell book or something like here's what you can do with just a voice no lyric just chord colors and and contrary motion and you know human you know res vocal resonance and it was just like this is pure magic this is all i want to do and and uh so you know to have that audio kind of count the song in and then kind of um you know the song itself is really like more overdubs than any other Fleet Foxes song by far. And, and um, it just meant a lot to me personally as kind of a, you know, a point A to point B kind of thing. You know, I, our guest today is Robin Pecknold of Fleet Foxes. The album is Shore. And I know we're running a little bit long, but I do want to mention that there is a companion film that you've released yeah. to go along with it. And it's been, I've seen it described different ways, different places documentary. I think it's more of a meditation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was a beautiful film my friend Kirsty made, um, you know, all around Washington State last month in August. And, you know, I think, you know, we had a limited time frame. And I think we knew, you know, she has a really wonderful eye for composition and just finding shots that are, you know, intriguing and, and, you know, letting the camera linger a, for a while on a certain frame so that your eyes are distracted enough that your ears open up in a different way you know, to kind of contrast with the music that's pretty, pretty often dense, you know, and um, getting, you know, getting updates from her while she was on the road, you know, we were stuck in the studio, I was kind of living vicariously through her getting to, you know, being all this beautiful nature in Washington State and, you know, prime time. And um, so that's my favorite way to, to experience the record is, is along with that visual. Um, and, and I'm really glad she made it and worked so hard on it and went above and beyond. And it's easy to find online as well. Robin Pecknell, the new album from Fleet Foxes is sure it is out now on Anti. And I just want to thank you for, you know, approaching music as an artist and, and treating it with respect. And it's not a commodity for you. It's, it's personal. Uh, and you bring everything that you've got to it. And, and for that reason alone, I'm a fan. But on top of that, this is just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous record that we're going to be playing for a very long time. Oh, thank you so much, John. Thank you. Robin Pagnol, Fleet Foxes on the Bridge.